Reason and Revolution by Herbert Marcuse, Part 2, The Rise of Social Theory, Chapter 2.4, The Foundations of Positivism and the Rise of Sociology, The Positive Philosophy of the State, Friedrich Julius Stahl. Notwithstanding its sinister aspects and anachronistic orientation, calling for a struggle against the Ancien Régime, when that had already been replaced by the new middle-class regime, symbolized quite clearly in the rule of the bourgeois king, Louis-Philippe. Comte's positivism expressed the consciousness of an advancing social class that had fought its triumphant way through two revolutions. The positive philosophy affirmed that the course of human history pressed towards ultimate subordination of all social relations to the interests of industry and science, implying that the state would be slowly absorbed by a society that would embrace the earth. In contrast to its form in France, positive philosophy in Germany was of quite a different caste. The political aspirations of the German middle class had been defeated without a struggle. While in England and France, feudalism was entirely destroyed, or at least reduced, as in the former country, to a few insignificant forms by a powerful and wealthy middle class, concentrated in large towns, and particularly in the capital, the feudal nobility in Germany had retained a great portion of their ancient privileges. The feudal system of tenure was prevalent almost everywhere. The lords of the land had even retained the jurisdiction um, Sorry, the jurisdiction over their servants. This feudal nobility, then extremely numerous and partly very wealthy, was considered officially the first order in the country. It furnished the higher government officials. It almost exclusively Um, officered the army. The restoration strengthened absolutism to such an extent that the bourgeoisie found itself hampered at every turn. The struggle against this absolutism, as against all German absolutism, ever since the wars of liberation, had been confined to the demand upon the monarchy to grant a representative form of constitution. Eventually, a promise was wrung from Frederick William III, that he would recognize some kind of popular sovereignty. This promise, however, materialized in the ridiculous reality of the provisional states, or the provisional estates, about which one historian had made the following comment. This was an outmoded system of representing special interests, with the knights holding undisputed predominance, especially in the eastern provinces. The condition for membership in the estates was grew. Grundegentum. Even in the provinces of the Rhine, the most industrial areas, 55 representatives of the land stood against 25 representatives of the towns. The middle, the middle class was a hopeless minority throughout. The interests of these provisional estates paralleled their impotence, and the whole is neatly shown in their level of debate. Johann Jacobi, one of the leaders of the democratic opposition, said about them, It would be hard to find an institution which is less popular and which the healthy sense of the people regards as a more useless burden than the provincial estates. Everyone would gladly spare us the work of proving from the records that among all the resolutions adopted there, not a single one could be found which was of any general interest. Flagrant abuses were not removed, nor were steps taken against any bureaucratic despotism. The entire work of the numerous sessions was confined to setting up houses of of correction, institutions for deaf mutes and the insanes, fire insurance companies, and to writing laws about new roads, wagon tracks, dog taxes, and so on. When Frederick William IV's government came upon the scene, All aspirations to a liberal liberal reform of the state made their exit. Absolutism triumphed, accompanied by a complete transformation of culture. The Prussia of von Steen's reforms of the Wars of Liberation and of Humboldt's 
and Hardenberg's strivings for a constitution became the Prussia of romantic monarchy, of theistic irrationalism, and of the Christian idea of the state. Berlin ceased to be the University of Hegel and the Hegelians and became that of the philosophers of the, Revel of the Revelation, Schelling and Stahl. The Hegelian system, which had viewed state and society as a negative totality and had subjected both to the historical process of reason, could no longer be approved as of the official philosophy, or as the official philosophy. Nothing was more suspect than reason and freedom to the new government that now took its cues from the Russian Tsar and Prince Metternich. It needed a positive principle of justification that would protect the state from rebellious forces and shield it more resolutely than Hegel did from the onslaught of society. The positivist reaction that set it in in Germany was, in the strict sense, a philosophy of the state and not of society. The slight breach of this development occurred when Lawrence von Steen, fusing the Hegelian tradition with the French movement, shifted the emphasis to the structure of society. Its effect on the development of social theory in Germany was negligible, however. The positive philosophy of the state continued to dominate German political theory in practice for decades. Stahl's philosophy offered a compromise to those who counseled personal absolutism and to the weak demand of the German middle class. He advocated a constitutional system of representation, though not of the people as a whole, but only of estates. Legal guarantees of civil liberties, inalienable personal freedom, equality before, before the law, and a rational system of laws. A rational system of laws. Stahl took great pains to distinguish his monarchic conservatism from any defense of arbitrary absolutism. The import of Stahl's philosophy lay definitely in its adjusting anti-rationalist authoritarian, authoritarianism to the social development of the middle class. For example, he combines the labor theory of property with the feudal doctrine that all property is, in the last analysis, held by the grant of the authorities. He advocates the Rechstadt, but subordinates its guarantee of civil liberties to the author authoritative sovereignty of the monarch. He was anti-liberal, yet he did not speak only for the feudal past, but for that period in the historical future when the middle class itself, anti itself became anti-liberal. His arch enemy was not the middle class, but the revolution that threatened this class, along with the nobility and the monarchist state. His anti-rationalism served the cause of a ruling aristocracy that stood in the way of rational progress. It also served the interest of all rule that could not be justified on rational grounds. The revolution Stahl declared is the world historic mark of our age. It would found the entire state on the will of man instead of on the commandment an ordinance of God. Significantly enough, the principle that the state rests on the will of men was precisely what the rising middle class had asserted when it carried on its fight against feudal absolutism. Stahl's doctrine repudiated the whole philosophy of Western rationalism that had accompanied this struggle. He condemned modern rationalism as the matrix of revolution. This philosophy, he said, is in the internal religious realm that uh, realm what revolution is in the external political realm, namely the estrangement of man from God. Since German rationalism had got its most representative expression through Hegel, Stahl concentrated his attack on the latter. He articulated the official reply of the ruling circles of Germany to the, to the Hegelian philosophy. These circles had a far deeper insight into the true character of Hegel's philosophy than had those academic interpreters who saw it as giving unconditional glorification to the existing order. Hegel's doctrine is a hostile force essentially destructive. His dialectic cancels the reality given, and his theory from the outset occupies the same ground as the revolution. His political philosophy, incapable of demonstrating the organic unity between subjects and the one supreme personality, God-King authority, undermines the foundations of the prevailing social and political system. 
we shall not quote more of the innumerable passages in which Stahl testifies to the subversive qualities of Hegelianism, but shall seek rather to set down the conceptions to which Stahl takes exception and on which he sees and on which he sees fit to heap condemnation. Stahl indicts Hegel along with the most outstanding represent representatives of European rationalism since Descartes, a configuration that recurs in the ideological attacks of National Socialism. Rationalism construes state and society on the pattern of reason, and in so doing lays down standards that must inevitably lead it to oppose all given truth and all given prestige. It contains, he says, the principle of false freedom, and has entailed all those ideas which find their ultimate consummation in revolution. Reason is never, is never satisfied with the truth that is given. It spurns the nutriment offered to it. Stahl saw the most dangerous embodiment of rationalism to be the theory of natural law. He summarized this theory as the doctrine that derives law and state from the nature of, of the, sorry, from the nature or reason of the individual man. Stahl counterposed to it the thesis that the mature that the nature and reason of the individual cannot serve as a norm for social or social organization. For it had always been in the name of the individual's reason that radical demands for a revolution had been advanced. Natural right could not be made to coincide with the given positive right any more than Hegel's rational state could, could with the given form of state. Stahl took the idea of natural law in its critical meaning. He understood it to invest the individual with more and higher rights than those the positive right gave him. He therefore opposed to the thesis of natural law the view that right and positive right are equivalent concepts. And to Hegel's negative dialectic, he opposed a positive philosophy of authoritarianism. We have sketched the disparagement of reason in the positive philosophy, and we have stated that the method of this philosophy implied a ready acceptance of the powers that be. Stahl's work verifies this assertion. He is a conscious positivist, motivated by the desire to save the worth of the positive, the concrete, the individual, the worth of the facts. He reproaches Hegel's philosophy for its alleged inability to explain the particular facts that compose the order of reality. Always preoccupied with the universal, Hegel never gets down to the individual contents of the given, which are its true contents. The conversion of science that Stahl advocates means a turn to positivism, a peculiar brand of it, to be sure, represented in Stahl's view by Schelling's positive philosophy. Schelling is lauded for having set the right of the historical against the logical, which is timeless and void of action. All that has grown in history out of the eternal life of the nation, all that has been sanctioned by tradition, possesses a truth of its own and is not answerable to reason. Stahl interprets Schelling in terms of the histori historisch Schul, which had used the special authority of the given to justify the existing positive right. In the article that set forth the program of the historisch Schul, Frederick Karl von Sevigny had written in 1814, there can be no question of a choice between good and evil, as if the acceptance of the given were good while its repudiation was evil and at the same time possible. The repudiation of the given is rather strictly impossible. The given, the given inevitably dominates us. We might be mistaken with regard to it, but we cannot change it. The prevailing law and the whole gamut of rights were part of the general life of the Volk, with which it had grown naturally throughout history. <coughs> Law and right could not be made subject to the critical standards of reason. The historical theory of seven Yi rejected, as the leader positivism did, the negative philosophy of rationalism, and particularly the doctrine of natural law, claiming that that philosophy was hostile to the established order. It likewise shared with the later positivist sociology the penchant for interpreting social processes in terms of natural ones. Everything in the life of society was an organism, and every organism good and right in itself. Schelling described the legal order as a natural order, so to speak, as a second nature, and he denounced all attempts to transform it in accordance with freedom's interest. The legal order is not a moral, 
but merely a natural order over which freedom has as little power and authority as it has over sensuous nature. It is therefore not surprising that all attempts to make the legal order a moral one present themselves in their own absurdity and in the most frightful form of despotism which immediately follows from it. The claim that nature was preeminent over society was intended as an antidote against the claims of the rational will to change given forms in accordance with the interest of free individuals. Stahl embodied the principles of the naturalist school in his positive philosophy with the express purpose of using them as principles of justification. He did not hesitate to emphasize at the beginning of his work that his philosophy had a protective function. For a century and a half, philosophy has founded authority, marriage, and property not on God's commandment and ordinance, but on man's will and consent. The peoples have followed this doctrine by defying the rulers and the historic order, and ultimately by rising against the just institution of property. And philosophy, any philosophy that derives the natural and moral universe from human reason, that is, from the laws and attributes of thought, undermines the given order and merits extermination. The positive philosophy that replaces it will foster deference to order and to authority, such as has been invoked by God to govern men, and to all rights and conditions that have become legitimate through his will. Order and authority, the two pivotal terms of Comte's positivism, re reappear in Stahl's political philosophy. He too offers his ideological services to the governing powers, no less persistently than did Comte. Stahl is particularly sensitive on the score of justifying property. Should we give over the question, what is property to the prudence, he demands. If, as rationalism had it, property is to draw its right only from man's will, it must follow that communism is right as, as against the philosophy of right uh, laid down from Grotius to Hegel and is also right as against present-day society. Property in the whole system of social and political relations must be withdrawn from any rationalist handling and must be justified on a more solid ground. Stahl's politi political philosophy strives to posit all the data of the prevailing social scheme as the data of a true and just reality. Its method is to bend human will and reason to, to the authority of those data. We shall not dwell at length on the method. Essentially, it consists in tracing by direct and indirect means. Achoo! Sorry. The entire social and political order to God's ordinance. The more vital the issue in question, the more direct the deriv derivation. The distribution of wealth is the work of God's ordinance. The institutions of society are based upon God's ordering of the of the world of mankind. Social inequality is God's will. There must be a different right for man, woman, and child, for the uneducated worker who is brought to law and the landlord who is free from trial. The right must differ in accordance with the vocation of the sex, age, estate, or class. The state and its authorities comprise a divine institution, and though men are free to live under this constitution or that, not only is the state as such God's command, but the particular constitution and the particular authorities everywhere possess divine sanction. The stall guy sounds like a blast. <clears throat> the method is associated with a personalistic philosophy that is the more insidious because it embodies the progressive ideas of middle class rationalism, interpreting them in an irrationalist context. The personality is exalted to a primordial being and a primordial concept. The created world culminates in the existence of the personality. The latter is an absolute end and the bearer of primordial right. This principle yields Stahl his notion of humanitarianism, namely that the welfare, right, and honor of every individual, even the lowest, is the community's concern that everyone must be considered, protected, honored, and provided for in accordance with his individuality without distinction of descent, uh, race, estate, gift. In the anti-rationalistic texture that is Stahl's philosophy, however, these progressive ideas take on the opposite of their original meaning. 
The radiance of personality puts the drab realities of the social system into shade and shows them forth only as a totality of personal relations emanating from the person of God and terminating on earth in the person of the sovereign monarch. State and society, which in reality are dominated by power relations and ruled by economic laws, appear as a moral Reich governed by ethical laws and rights and duties. The restoration appears as a world made for the development of the personality. Stahl's premature personalism illustrates a decisive truth about modern philosophy. That the standpoint of the concrete is frequently farther from the truth than the abstract. The reaction against German idealism saw an intellectual tendency gaining momentum to merge philosophy with the concreteness of actual life. The demand was made that man's concrete locus in existence should replace abstract concepts in philosophy and become the standard of thought. But when his concrete existence bears witness of an irrational order, the defamation of abstract thought and the surrender to the concrete amounts to a surrender of philosophy's critical motives of its opposition to an irrational reality. Stahl offered his concrete personality theory as a substitute for Hegel's abstract universalism. The substance of the world was to be the personality in its concrete existence and not reason, but a universalism came to the fore that was far more dangerous than Hegel's. The totality of existing inequalities and distinctions in the given social and political reality were immediately posited and affirmed in the personality. The personality had its concrete existence in the specific relations of subordination and domination that held in the social reality, while in the social division of labor, the personality was an object to be governed. All these inequalities, Stahl held, belong to the nature of personality and may not be questioned. The equality of men does not exclude distinctions and grades, inequality of actual rights, inequality even of legal status. We shall indicate now only the fundamental tendencies of Stahl's positive philosophy of the state. The personalist principle in the universe implies that all domination has a personal character, that is, has the character of conscious personal authority. In the civil order, domination is vested in the many tentacles of the state organism that emanate from and center about the natural personality of the monarch. The state is essentially a monarchy. It may take the form of a representative government, but in any case, the sovereignty of the monarch must stand above the various estates. Stahl accepts Hegel's separation of state from society, but renders it far less strict by interpreting all social relations as moral ones. He advocates this, that the state exercise a far-reaching regulation of the economy. He is opposed to unlimited freedom of trade and commerce. The state is a union of the people under authority. As a moral realm, the state has this twofold aim. On the one hand, domination as such namely the end that authority prevail among men, and on the other hand, the protection and advancement of men, the development of the nation, and execution of God's command. The state is no longer bound by the interests of the individual, but is a power and subject prior to and above the individual members. Authority is the force that, in the last analysis, binds the social and political relations to the whole. The entire system functions through obedience, duty, and acquiescence. All domination involves the acceptance of the ruler's thought and will in the existence of those ruled. This is a striking anticipation of the character type urged and molded by the modern authoritarian state. Hegel would have regarded such a statement as a horror. The surrender of individual thought and will to the thought and will of some external authority runs counter to all the principles of his idealist rationalism. Stahl entirely detaches the state from any connection with the autonomy of its individuals. State and society cannot originate from and depend on them. Its preservation requires a power that rests solely on ordinance, is independent of the will of individuals, nay, is opposed to it, and compelling it from, with it, with, from without. Reason is displaced by obedience, which becomes the primary and irremissible motive and the foundation of all morality. The liberalist philosophy is, is relinquished even before the social and economic ground of liberalism has become a fact. 
Whereas the French social economists could look upon the progress of industrial capitalism as a challenge, calling for the transformation of existing social and political relations into an order that might develop individual potentialities. Men like Stahl had to concern themselves with the salvation of a system oriented to the past and to some ex- and to some eternal Im- and immutable hierarchy. When Stahl therefore criticizes the prevailing labor process, for example, when he appears shocked by the calamity of the factor system and machine production and makes reference to Sismondi, he is nevertheless far from drawing any consequences. State and society remained bound by divine command and historical tradition. They are as they ought to be. The people is a community stronger than all class stratification. Volkskimmenschaft is a fact. The community, not the individual, is the final subject of right. Only the Volk possesses the unity of Lebensanschung and the germ of creative production. Tradition and custom ingrown among the people are the source of right. The individual's quest for freedom and happiness is diverted by being referred to the irrational community, which is always right. That which has germinated and become uh, preserved in the natural growth of history is true in itself. Man is not an absolutely free being. He is created and limited one, hence dependent upon the power, hence dependent upon the power that gave him his existence and on the given order of life and the given authorities through whom this power let him in, let him into uh, existence. The authorities therefore hold full power over him even without his consent. In all its aspects, the philosophy of Stahl stands out as having deserted the progressive ideas that Hegel's system had attempted to save for the society in which they had originated and in which they were later betrayed. Reason is superseded by authority, freedom by submission, right by duty, and the individuals put at the mercy of the unquestionable claims of a hypostasized whole. Stahl's philosophy of right gathers together some of the fundamental conceptions that later guided the preparation of national socialist ideology. Such are the implications of the positive philosophy which claimed to supplant the negative philosophy of Hegel.